Open your Bibles, if you can, to the Psalms. We are looking at a particular portion in the, in the, in the Bible, and I'm only probably going to be doing just three messages on this set. Um, and there was a set of Psalms in the Bible known as the Apocalyptic Psalms. Um, it was one that I... Uh, we, we recognize one of the wonderful things about the Psalms. The Psalms are found right in the middle of the Bible. It is one of the 66 books of the Bible. It is the longest book. It has the largest amount of chapters. There's 150 chapters in the book of Psalms. And it's found right in the middle of your Bible. Um, there is an incredible structure to, to it where we identify different aspects of the Psalm that deal with different things. The Psalms we recognize deal with every aspect of human emotion. We've seen that. And it's a pouring out of the heart of man towards God. The Psalms are praises to God. The incredible thing about the Psalms is that their language is uniquely elevated in the Bible. There is a, there is a real, real lifting up of the words because they are worship to God. They're not narrative. They're not narrative, they're also not necessarily prophetic, although there's certainly prophetic aspects of them. But they are, most importantly, praises of God. And there is no language that you can elevate high enough to praise God. There's certainly language that you can elevate far too high to praise man. But to praise God, there is no language that can be used to, to be elevated highly enough. And, um, and the Psalms certainly have a, a real elevated nature to them with regards to their words and how they are. But what we discovered last week was fascinating because we discovered a set of 10 Psalms. And other than the other aspects of some of the Psalms, we talked about the imprecatory Psalms and, the, um, and, and, and those Psalms that are, that, are, that, are, that are petitioning the Lord because of sin or, or anything like that. These are actually found in a group, in a set, one next to another. They are a group of 10 from Psalm 91 to Psalm 100. The other thing that we discovered last week was that they seem to be very much chronological. There's a chronological nature to them. And when you read them through time after time, you can't help but be able to recognize that chronology. And it matches the chronology that we see in the Bible with respect to the last days. The the fascinating thing about it, it is that they are referred to historically, and this is hundreds of years ago, as the apocalyptic psalms. Apocalypse, what a a word. We hear it in in common parlance. We hear it as they speak about it as, oh, this is Armageddon. This is is the things that the Bible speaks, the apocalypse. Or what is the apocalypse? People always refer to and look at the apocalypse as this is obviously the, you know, the, the, the end times, the judgment of God and all that sort of thing. Well, to a degree, that's true, but apocalypse simply means the unveiling. It simply means the revelation of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible, Genesis is the beginning of the Bible, deals with first things. Revelation is at the end of the Bible, deals with last things. The book of Revelation is, is, is commonly known as the apocalypse. That's what it refers to. It's the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is and his coming to, um, to, to judge the world. So Psalm 91 to 100 is set in a time frame that we can refer to as the terminal generation. This generation that Jesus actually spoke of when he said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. It was his apostles that actually asked the Lord, what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the world. And Jesus didn't mince his words. He gave a clear understanding of that, beginning first of all with be not deceived. And this is referred to three times in the the New Testament. We see it in the most famous aspect of it in Matthew 24. We see it again in Mark 13. We also see it in Luke chapter 21. They're not necessarily repetitions, but there's not a lot of difference between them. The the clarity with regards to those signs of the times of the end are pretty clear in all three of those those portions in Scripture. So we see these 10 Psalms being somewhat 
chronological. They're fascinating. We identified Psalm 91 as the psalm that opens the account. First, being as a shelter to those who put their trust in the Lord. It's the only one of the 10 psalms that actually presents the gospel, which is fascinating in itself. It presents the gospel with clarity. It tells the lost how they can be saved and to be saved and to turn to the Lord. It speaks of that. It, and it also has this incredible, and, I'm, and, and I know that a lot of you were blown away by this when you saw it last week. You've no doubt read Psalm 91, goodness knows how many times, but you've never seen it in this set of 10. This first chronological psalm speaking historically about the last days has a triple reference to plagues and to pestilences. It's the only psalm of the 10 that refers to a pandemic virus by which many lives are taken. Is this a coincidence? Well, there are no coincidences in the Bible. Everything's there for a purpose and a reason. Jesus spoke about pestilences and famines and that being signs of the coming of the end of the world. And he related to that. It was curious for us because it's the opening of the 10 apocalyptic Psalms. And we're living today in the fear of just such a thing as this. And it's the first time in history that we actually see this very event being excused as an opportunity to completely alter the governing principle of the entire world. And that's never happened before. This is unique and we have to accept that this is unique. It's changing the entire governing principle of the world and it's accepted as doing so and it's expected to be continually doing so. That's never happened before. That's never happened before. It didn't happen during the Spanish flu. It didn't happen during the, um, during the plague that, that, that destroyed you know, nearly two-thirds of Europe. It didn't happen before. And now here it is happening in just such a way. That was Psalm 91. Psalm 92 again begins with giving praise to the Lord. But in the middle of the psalm, it identifies a very quick rising up of the wicked. It says, When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish. This is this distinguishing characteristic between the wicked and the righteous. And one will, will, will grow, will, will manifest itself so evidently, but will be destroyed forever while the other will flourish. Verse 7 of that text says, When the wicked spring is grass and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree and he shall grow like the cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Psalm 93 moves on and it's a reminder that God is the one who is in control. It's one of the most common comforts that I've heard today, interestingly enough. It's the comfort that tells us that God is in control. It's the way we comfort each other. We know that God is in control and in that respect we are comforted. In verse 1 it says, The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. In verse 2 it says, Thy throne is established of old, thou art from everlasting. As the days unfold before us, it's vitally important to have brought to our minds that the Lord is sovereign, that he is in control. We see again in verse 3 that there's an indication of disquiet among the people of the world. The world is turning itself inside out and upside down. The Bible speaks about the, the people of the world as the seas and as the waters and it speaks about them in a metaphorical way because every time it refers to the seas and the waters rising up or overtaking or being uh, or the waves of the sea being boisterous that's related to the people of the world rising up that are well i guess protesting and 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 rioting in the streets and It speaks about also when the seas are calm and it refers to the world. The the people of the world is settled and calm and at peace. And yet here we have this interesting passage in verse 3 and it says, The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice, the floods lift up their waves. Again, it's something that we're seeing and witnessing in the entire world today. It doesn't matter if you're in Hong Kong, in India, in the USA or in Australia. 
The human wave is not limited to stadiums, it seems. It's also beginning to rage in the streets of the world. Nevertheless, verse 4 says, The Lord is on high. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. The psalm concludes with the assurance of his testimonies, the word of God. So it's incredible to see all these things happening in our very days. It's incredible to see the psalms actually, and especially this set of psalms, reflect exactly that, to manifest exactly that. And, uh, and that's, that's, got to be, that's got to amaze most people who look at this in, the, uh, in its proper light. The group of psalms that has been known as dealing with the beginning of the last days right up until the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. To see it play itself out, out before our own eyes is, is quite incredible. And that's why these days that are before us, for the Christian, it is, it's exciting. It's exciting because we're seeing the word of God come alive. And it's exciting because even Paul speaks about it in Romans 13. He says, And knowing that the time that it is now high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light. The day is at hand. And we don't know how much time there is left, but there is a time when the church is going to be caught up and taken to be with the Lord and the world is going to go through the most horrific time in its history. The time that we know of as the tribulation, the seven years. The title of the message this morning is dealing with Psalm 94. And um, it has a really encouraging title to it. It's called The Road to Ruin. Well, maybe that's not as encouraging, but it actually gives us an understanding of what Psalm 94 is because Psalm 91 tells us the beginning of things. Psalm 92 goes on and explains the difference and demonstrates the difference between the wicked and the righteous. Psalm 93 reminds us of who God is. Now, Psalm 94 goes into a little bit more detail with respect to the road to ruin that the world is, is headed towards. And before we get into it, I want to open with a, with a word of prayer. Again, dear Lord, I come to you, dear Father, and, and truly plead, dear Lord, that you would help me to grow and help us all to grow in the knowledge of who you are, that you would be with us and that you would lead us through this psalm and that you would bring clarity to our own minds. I pray, dear Lord, that you would in every way hide me behind your cross and that the word of God would just speak for itself in every way. We thank you in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. First point to this morning, Psalm 94, is the first point is the road to ruin is paved with ignorance. The road to ruin is paved with ignorance. Have a look at verse 1. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth. O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things? And all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Sorry, trying to change the viewing. There's a lot of things that this psalm talks about. The psalmist cries this familiar cry of many people. It seeks for justice and it seeks for justice against a population of people who continually triumph in wickedness. It's, it's one of those questions that come up. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? There's a, there's a plea here, but there's also this perplexity. There's this plea the desires that they might fail in their endeavors 
instead of prospering. There's a plea that the wicked would just receive the recompense of their reward, that they will be dealt with according to that which is right, that they would receive the wages of their own wickedness. But there's also this, um, there's also this perplexity. How can it be that the wicked should triumph? How does that make any sense? And this is, this is probably the most fascinating question of all because even those people who believe that all of existence is an accident, um, even in their minds it seems contrary to logic that evil should prosper. It seems as if life should never work this way. And even those who don't have a biblical perspective recognise this. From a biblical perspective, the idea can be justified because the universe was created to function according to God's laws. So it can't reward the wicked in the end. But in an accidental universe, that doesn't have any such boundary. Yet it seems to be the first question in the mouth of the lost that would deny the existence of God. They seem to be the first ones who have the question of evil as their fundamental question in their departure from God. They ask the question of evil and we all know it. You know, if God exists, why does he let bad things happen? In that particular frame of reference, there's an identification of evil. But in order to identify evil, there has to be a standard of good to which they can identify. But in an accidental universe, there is no such standard. There is no such standard. Yet they recognize it intuitively. Why? Well, because Jesus is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. There's a recognition of the moral law, the moral code of God within man. Yet from a logical perspective, it doesn't fit. The psalmist mourns the prosperity of the wicked. Where are, there are wicked individuals who have long prospered in their wickedness. Um, many are ignorant that they're even doing evil and the road to ruin is paved with ignorance. Most genuinely think that they, they're simply misunderstood. Many of these people think that they're just misunderstood. You know, it's interesting that that seems to be the underlying theme of the Netflix series Lucifer. He's just this, you know, he's just Satan who happens to be mis, a misunderstood sibling of God. And his end goal is, um, is good, though the means aren't necessarily good. He's just misunderstood. Netflix is the most progressively perverse confirmation company in the world. Its goal is the progressive conforming of its viewers into the very image of the devil who runs the programming. And it is programming. Might be my own perspective, but I don't believe any true Christian should be tithing to it every month. Nevertheless, there are wicked people who triumph, even though they slay the widow and the stranger and murder, murder the fatherless. Some murder willfully. Some murder willfully. Men such as Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, Franco, Pinochet. These individuals murder deliberately. They do so without ignorance. They do so with all conscience. Some do so, however, in order to bring about what they believe is a good end. A form of industrial manslaughter, if you will. And this includes several of the uh, above individuals, but can also include many people who are in government today. These are the ones who brag about what they're doing and what they intend to do. We see that in verse 4. And all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. Like Klaus Schwab, who I mentioned last week, He's the head of the World Economic Forum and he sees the China virus as an opportunity that has long been awaited to literally, in his words, reset the world. And this is in their own document known as the Great Reset. You can find that on the World Economic Forum website. The Great Reset. An hour and five minutes or an hour and 15 minute long video with such prominent people as Prince Charles, the head of the United Nations, the head of the World Economic Forum himself, and also um, the head of the, uh, the World Health Organization. All of these individuals feature in that, in that documentary or in that, 
in that video, and that was made three, nearly four months ago. The China virus was only a few months old, and yet there seems to be an incredible opportunity in their minds to take advantage of. He stated this categorically. He stated that we're not going to be going back to normal, and it seems that the governments of the world are obeying his every command. Indeed, the press, to bring about the greatest financial catastrophe in the history of the world, will threaten to even break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. There's a road to ruin that some who are ignorant are well and truly on the, on the way down. These are such people who actively destroy people's lives and they think that the cost is worth it because the ends justify the means. Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews spoke of not caring about human rights abuses because he says he's saving lives. These are the workers of iniquity that boast themselves and they break in pieces the lives of others. And they excuse themselves for doing so, thinking that performing evil can somehow miraculously bring about good. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say the Lord shall not see neither shall the God of Jacob regard it in verse 7. It's interesting. It's interesting how many people think honestly that their sins are, are hidden. Well, they might be hidden from the eyes of the world and that's their ultimate goal because they honestly don't believe that the Lord shall see. They don't believe that the God of Jacob will regard it. They think that they will be able to get away with their sin. They think that their sins will never find them out. They know that the world has a short memory. And they trust that their sins won't find them out eternally. Respecting the Lord, he is far from their thoughts, far from their minds. They don't know him, nor do they fear him. Yet they say the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. The road to ruin is simply paved with ignorance. Not just any ignorance, mind you. It's the sort of ignorance that actually forms the strongest mortar in the joints of those pavers to ruin. It's an ignorance known simply as willful ignorance. It's the state of the heart that simply doesn't want to believe the truth. This is an incredible thing and we see this time and time and time again. This belief, this idea that God will not see, man will not see. They, they, they reject the truth that is right before their eyes because they want to remain willfully ignorant. They have a, a predisposition to protect their own view of themselves. They want to see themselves as righteous. They want to see themselves as good. They want to see themselves as high as li and lifted up. And they don't want to see themselves anything contrary to that. So if there's any other idea that would present itself contrary to the view that we have of ourselves, then we don't want to view it. There's a problem with that. And the problem with that is that reality eventually comes to fruition. We're woken up by reality. The road to ruin is paved with ignorance, but the mortar of that ignorance and the strongest mortar of all is willful ignorance. Second point this morning is the road to ruin is signed with correction. The road to ruin is signed with correction. Let me explain. When I was 29 years old, um, I was 29 years old when I became a Christian. I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. I had no church background whatsoever, nothing. Um, and I, to be honest, I could have cared less about it. I really I wasn't, wasn't interested in Christianity, wasn't interested in things concerning what the Bible taught. I was travelling well and even really quickly on, on the road to ruin. Um, when I look back at my life before I was a Christian, from this side of it, I now see signs along the way that effectively said, wrong way, go back. These were signs of correction. And the signs that people gave me along the way in my life were all there to tell me, wrong way, go back. The young girl in Footscray Mall when I was a teenager hanging out with my mates told me, wrong way, go back. Even the little things like running to the train station and praying <laughs> after that encounter that the train would be late. Praying to who? I don't know. I didn't believe in God. 
and, and, and the train found out that it was late. It was 20 minutes, my one train took off and I thought that was the one that I just missed and the conductor tells me, no, no, that the one to Backers Marsh is, is 20 minutes late. You know? That was another sign for me, wrong way, go back. There was a video on biblical prophecy that I watched at my girlfriend's house not long after also said to me, wrong way, go back. The Christmas services that my girlfriend, who became my wife, she's my ex-girlfriend, um, she used to drag me to these Christmas services. And those Christmas services also said, wrong way, go back. The road to ruin is signed with correction all the way along it. It's interesting though, because the road to ruin is not a road that is always comfortable. Um, yes, there's some glazed sections that rush you speedily along, but there are also some serious potholes. There's debris along the way that encourage you to take another road. The drugs told me that there's another road. The womanizing told me that there's another road. The alcohol told me that there's another road. Uh, the, the fighting in the streets told me that there's another road. But in our minds, we say that the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. That's what our minds say. And it sounds like the anthem of my life up until that age. So I want you to look now at the simple logic of God's correction. Have a look at verse 8. So verse 7 said, The Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Have a look at verse 8. It says, Understand ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will you be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastiseth the heathen, shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall not he know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. So you see, dotted along the road to ruin is the simple sign of logic. It's an interesting sign <clears throat> because it only ever appears when you're looking at it. It doesn't appear otherwise. It only appears when you're looking at it, like Schrodinger's cat. It only appears when it's observed. It's not big, but it's always there every single time we turn our heads. Evil is identified in spite of our, be of our believing that there are no moral absolutes. Interesting, isn't it? Before we came to the Lord, evil is still identified in spite of our believing there are no moral absolutes. Purpose and function is assumed in every creature in spite of believing in a purposeless universe. We trust our minds to deny the reality of God in spite of also believing that our minds are the object of random accidental collocation of atoms. Yet we still trust it. We deny the existence of truth anywhere in the world in spite of believing that that premise is true. We reject all absolutes. Absolutely. We believe life and everything in it is meaningless and we mean it. We sin with abandon in spite of condemning those who sin against us. There is so many logical contradictions in how we stand in a world that denies the reality of who God is. And within our minds, we simply cannot cross that bridge unless we come to accept the reality that God is. He does see. He does know. He does hear. So dotted along the road to ruin is the simple sign of logic. It's not big, but it appears every time we look at it. You believe God will not hear vain words. Nevertheless, he that planted the ear, shall he not hear? You believe God will not see the sin you commit, yet he that formed the eye, shall he not see? You believe God won't know the sin that you claim to have forgotten, and yet he that teacheth man knowledge, shall he not know? There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death says Proverbs 16.25. Friends, there's a way of escaping all of this. There's a way of escaping. There's a way in which you can be set free from that current conflicting, contradictory dilemma of the mind. And I'm going to bring that about shortly. 
But for now, I want you to keep in mind that there is nothing covered that will not be revealed. There is nothing hidden that will not one day be seen. Third point this morning is that the road to ruin is avoided by the corrected. Verse 12 in the text. It says, Blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth, O Lord, and teacheth him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. But judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in heart shall follow it. There's something incredible that happens when you decide that you're willing to believe the truth no matter where it takes you. After all, there's truly little point in believing a lie when reality arrives. There's no, did you know that there's no beneficiary to a lie? There's no beneficiary to a lie. People who are the recipients of deceit are only ever seen as victims. They're not beneficiaries. They're always seen as victim. And the person we lie to the most in life is guess who? Yeah, ourselves. We lie to ourselves more than we lie to anybody else in our lives. It's little wonder we can never benefit from self-deceit. Yet self-deception is a growing malady in today's world. We've abandoned the truth of the Bible and now we simply make it up as we go along. Every man is doing just that which is right in his own eyes. Another biblical principle. Self-deception is the slippery coating that glazes the road to ruin. But those willing to be corrected, those who have taken heed of the signs, letting them know that they're going the wrong way, they will avoid to road to, the road to ruin and, and find for themselves a narrow, a narrow way. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. The beginning and the opening of the New Testament. In the seventh chapter, we have Jesus speaking. This is part of his Great Sermon on the Mount as that comes to a close in chapter 7. And he says in verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Straight gate. The word straight is set in opposition to the word wide. It's given its synonym in the word narrow. We hear it used in phrases like a straight jacket. Okay, So it's not meaning as opposed to crooked. It's meaning tight, narrow, straight. Something happens to you when you get off the road to ruin, which is also known as the broad way in the Bible. And that is that you begin to see something with absolute horror. How many people are on it? So I never noticed it before. Before I, before I came to the Lord, I, I never noticed that I was on the road to ruin. I had no idea that I was. But when I got off it, it was absolutely astounding to me. It was, like my, it was like all of a sudden the light flicked on and I could see how many people are on the road to ruin. And no, no wonder, no wonder a, a famous Australian band referred to it as the highway to hell, you know, it's, it, it, it aptly fits what I was able to see once I got off that road. We went overseas last year and some of the airports are huge, absolutely huge airports. And they've got very, very, very long walks to be able to get to your other plane. And along those walks, when you, when you get there, you find that they've installed what's known as travelators. They're like escalators, but they just travel. Right? They, they, they just travel horizontally. These are mechanical belts that move people along to get them to their destination pretty quickly. Some who are in a hurry walk along those travelators. It's pretty cool. You, know? you actually feel like Michael Jackson doing a moonwalk, going backwards but going forwards. You know? It's pretty cool. And you're walking along these travelators, but there's some who are really in a hurry and they literally run over the travelators to get to where they want to go. When you get off the road to ruin, 
and you're miraculously saved by the Lord, you begin to see that the road to ruin is just like those travelators, but very, very, very wide. It's not that the road to ruin is itself taking people along to their desired. It's not that the road to ruin is not only itself taking people along to that desired destination like those travelators, but that some are even running to get to hell that much quicker. But those who are chastened by the Lord, those who are happy to be corrected, these are turned about. These receive life and they will never, ever, ever turn to that road to ruin again. There is a miraculous transformation. The greatest miracle of all is those who have been literally transformed by God simply by believing that he died for their sins. It's something that's impossible to explain. It doesn't mean that the Christian doesn't still find themselves in sin. It just means that God now preserves that individual and they will never, ever, ever feel comfortable on that road to ruin again. Never. Matter of fact, trying to get back on there again is nothing but a form of misery to those who have come to believe the gospel. And it's, and it's one of the biggest struggles that we have. We've got to make that decision, All right now I believe in the Lord. It's time to just stay off and follow, and follow that narrow way. And it's such a wonderful joy. So why the Bible tells us something incredible with regards to those who repent of their sin and turn to Christ. The Bible says that there is joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. It's why the Bible also teaches that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And also in Proverbs 11.30 that the fruit of the righteous are as a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. It's this doing the work that God wants us to be doing to be able to share the hope that is in Christ. It's nothing to do with our goodness. We cannot, simp- we cannot be good enough. We cannot be good enough to enter into everlasting life. It's a form of humility that just accepts what God has already done. That's why Jesus died. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't come to judge the world at the time. He came to save it. He came to save it. That was the first time. But this next time, after 2,000 years of the gospel being shared and now finally almost rejected around the world, he will come to judge it. He will come to judge it. And that's why there's this plea within that, this entire series of events that God would turn people back to him again, maybe for one last time. The last point this morning is the road to ruin remunerates its builders. The road to ruin remunerates its builders. We'll take it up at verse 20. It says there, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? We'll speak about that in a moment. They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemned and condemn the innocent blood. But the Lord is my defence, and my God is the rock of my refuge. And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity. He shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. Verse 20. It's got this interesting phrase. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee? In other words, shall there be uh, you know, iniquity having fellowship with God? Well, clearly not. You know, it's amazing how many people actually believe that their good outweighs their bad and they think that they're going to have fellowship with God. So they think if they're 51% righteous, they can have fellowship with God who is 100% righteous. It doesn't work that way. Can two walk together except they be agreed? No, they can't walk together except they be agreed. We have to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. That's why Jesus died for our sins. Our sins were put upon him. He died for it because of his death for our sins, being judged for our sins, his righteousness is then given to us. We are then justified. We're clear. We've used the example so many times. It's like having an, an unaffordable fine that you cannot pay for yourself. 
And the judge takes off his robe, comes down, puts the, um, the, 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 the money to pay for that fine on the bench, and goes back up and puts his robe back on. And you have a choice. You can either pay for it yourself or you can accept what's been given to you as a gift to settle the debt. That's what Jesus did. Therefore, because of what he did, we are legally free. We are legally free. He paid the penalty of our sin. And because of that, we are free. And we can have fellowship with him because it's his righteousness. We're now clean. And clean forever. Clean forever. Eternally secure. Held by Christ and his righteousness. But the end of days is going to be filled with unelected government officials framing mischief by a law. When man rejects the law of God, he binds man with his own laws crafted in mischief. That's what it says in the text here, which frameth mischief by a law. In 1976, the Argentinian government was deposed by a military junta headed by Lieutenant General Jorge Videla. Between 1976 and 1981, a law was crafted in mischief titled the process of national reorganisation, but known by the people of Argentina as the Dirty War. Under this process, some good things did happen. General Videla managed to get Argentina's inflation rate down from 600% to 138%. That's pretty good, don't you think? It's good to get your inflation down, 600% to 138%. That way, that means $10 today will be worth you know, $3.50 tomorrow. So that's encouraging. That's exciting to know that. You know? Otherwise, it would have been worth, well, six times less than 10. Every year, sorry, secretly, though, his military junta operated under a declaration of a state of war. And it was designed to silence those who allegedly opposed them. Up to 30,000 young sons and fathers were kidnapped over a decade, over less than a decade, over a period of five years. They were, without trial, put into secret detention camps indefinitely. Up to 30,000 people were dealt with this way and they were never seen again. Many of them were taken up in an aeroplane because Argentina is right by the ocean and pushed out of the plane into the ocean. Um, it's an incredible history of Argentina. And every year for 40 years, mothers and grandmothers and wives who lost their children, grandchildren and husbands in the dirty war came out to silently protest the government for those known as desparecidos or also known as the disappeared. These are the disappeared. It seems that the military junta who were taking over Argentina at the time took their understanding of the method of disappearing people from none other than um, Augusto Pinochet in Chile, who did exactly the same thing about three years earlier in Chile. Augusto Pinochet reigned until I think it was the 1990s and he was a dictator and he was famous for disappearing people. This is a process where people can come into your home at whatever time of night, usually it's of night, it was the same thing was done in Nazi Germany, and literally take people away and they're never seen from again. These laws were created by mischief and they were enacted to justify the abuse of civil and human rights. Beloved, we are seeing exactly this occurring in Australia today. Oh, not to the point that people are being disappeared, but the foundation is being laid, and most evidently in Victoria. It's what's been seen time and time again historically in regimes that do not have the rule of law as their governing principle. Never has there been emergency powers enacted in Australia that gave rise to clear abuses of civil and human rights treating average people as criminals and creating a state of fear. This has never happened in Australia before. Never, ever happened in Australia before. Matter of fact, you have to go all the way back to the Eureka Stockade in northern Victoria to even find a hint of something like this happening in Australia before. It has never happened. We've had state of emergencies before. 
but never ever have civil rights been so terribly abused by what is known as simply a flu virus. No matter whatever the strength of that virus is, there's more than enough governing principles out there to tell us that the rule of law must still be held. People still need to be treated with dignity. People still need to be handled respectfully. People still need to be dealt with in a, other, in a manner other than how they've been dealt with. On the 13th of October, this is next month, a final vote is going to be taken on a bill titled the COVID-19 Omnibus Emergency Measures and Other Acts Amendment Bill 2020. Under this bill, a new division, Division 2, under the Public Health and Wellbeing Act, and you can read it from page 7 to 10, these are some of the laws that the government wants to have appointed. The Secretary can appoint under a new section, section 250, and I quote, a person the Secretary considers appropriate for appointment based on the person's skills, attributes, experience or otherwise. Well, that narrows it down, doesn't it? These same individuals, yet under another new section, Section 250, which modifies Section 192, provides that an authorised person, that's this person now employed, may be assisted by any person in exercising a public health risk power under an authorisation given by the Chief Health Officer. So in other words, this unskilled individual can appoint any other unskilled individual to help him out. And it also includes a, a, a police officer. Under a new section, section 252, titled Further Emergency Powers, and I quote, the emergency powers are to detain any person or group of persons in an emergency area for the period reasonably necessary to eliminate or reduce a serious risk to public health. A period reasonably necessary, read that indefinite detention. Now, to detain them indefinitely. The second part of it. To restrict the movement of any person or group of persons within an emergency area. The third to prevent any person or group of persons from entering an emergency area. The fourth, to give any other direction that the authorised officer considers is reasonably necessary to protect public health. Read that. Any other direction. That narrows it down, doesn't it? Nice and specific for us so we know how we're not disobeying the law. Quote again, new section 200A will give designated authorised officers further emergency powers relating to high risk persons. New section 200A part 1 provides that a designated authorised officer may detain a person under section 201 part A of the Public Health and Wellbeing Act if a direction has been given in the exercise of an emergency power under that part 200. But this one here, I love this one. This one's great. You're going to enjoy this. The designated, quote, this is reading directly from the bill. You can download it on the internet. I've got, I'll put a link in the website. I'll, I might even include this entire section at the bottom of my sermon when I put the notes up. The designated officer reasonably believes that a person who is required to comply with the direction is a high-risk person and is likely to refuse or fail to comply with the direction. I don't know if you really got that. A designated officer, this is, any unskilled individual who the Chief of Officer decides to employ can actually authorise any other, any other individual to help them out, that if they reasonably believe the person is a high-risk person and they reasonably believe that the individual is likely to refuse or fail to comply with the direction, they can therefore take them and detain them indefinitely. We got that? This is framing mischief by a law. This is one of the, the most dangerous portion of a law that I've ever seen being put up in Victoria, in the, in the entire country of Australia. It was, it was Julia Gillard who a number of years ago tried to reverse the burden of proof, tried to make you innocent in order to prove yourself Tried to make you guilty and then you had to prove yourself innocent. This is exactly the same. It reverses the burden 
of proof reasonably believes that a person who is required to comply with the direction is a high risk person and is likely to refuse or fail to comply with the direction. Anybody seen the Minority Report? Minority Report with Tom Cruise, pre-crime. That's what's being enacted or tried to be, trying to be enacted within our law. It's a law framed by mischief, by wicked men. This act has already been condemned in a letter by a group of judges and QCs and noted as, quote, unprecedented, excessive and open to abuse. Beloved, the burning of the Reichstag in Germany, the German parliament, in 1933, moved Adolf Hitler to claim emergency powers. It was those powers that destroyed the nation of Germany and instilled fears in the people of Germany that eventually led to World War II. It came out that it was Hitler's brown shirts that actually set fire to the Reichstag to begin with, where he had the justification to create a state of emergency. Once a state of emergency has been declared by people with this sort of desire for power, it's rarely ever handed back in that respect. We are past a state of emergency in Victoria. We are now a state of disaster. A handful of people who have contracted the virus and a number of elderly people in nursing homes who have died and therefore a state of disaster. Declaration for a state of disaster, examples that are given are a meteor strike. <laughs> you know, I don't know how this fits with that, but there doesn't seem to be any... It's just considered what's reasonable or what's obviously reasonable to some can be a madness to others. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? These politicians frame mischief by a law, but beloved, they will never ever have the favour of the Lord in doing so. They will have no fellowship with the Lord for it. Nevertheless, they gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. This is what should be able to be expected to see as we move towards the close of this world. This is what's going to be happening all over the world in time. We will be having unelected individuals governing us. We will not be able to depose them. It will not be a democratic rule. This is part of the Great Reset. And it's a tragedy to to watch it unfold. We knew it would unfold, but watching it happen is a concern. Nevertheless, the Lord is my defence and my God is the rock of my refuge. To be honest, I, I don't know how people are dealing with all of this without the Lord. He, he, I don't know how people are dealing with this without the Lord. I, I, I truly don't. I, can, I, can, I understand that they're continually looking forward, they're continually hoping for a resumption of normality. I oh, will just get out of this and we'll be right. The sun will shine again. But the Bible doesn't present this as necessarily the case. And when you read the writings and listen to the individuals who are using this as an opportunity, they say otherwise. There is an understanding in the scripture that the Lord is our defense. He is our rock. He is our joy. He is our hope. Job was the one who said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. God has eternity in view, not our temporary comforts. It's eternity that is in view. Our life is a vapour. It will be here today and it will be gone tomorrow. Daniel's friends weren't careful in answering King Nebuchadnezzar with respect to his demand for them to fall down and worship the golden image that he set up. They simply said... If God will deliver us, then he will deliver us. But if God doesn't deliver us, know therefore, O king, that we will not fall down and worship your golden image. They didn't mind dying for the sake of understanding that God is their deliverer. We've seen this historically in the past. Persecu persecution has come upon Christians from the very time of the beginning. They were the ones fed to the lions and yet singing hymns in the arenas. And in their hymns and their humility converted multitudes of people in the arena to this faith that would withstand such evil. What sort of faith is that? It's a faith that knows the Lord. It's the faith that stands courageously. It's the faith that we see, interestingly, being manifested in, in even sporting stars. You know, men like Israel Folau who stand there while every other pretend of a man is on his knee, 
bowing down to the to to the to the to the Black Lives Marxist political movement, aka BLM. He stands while they bend their knee. He stands and he will only bend his knee to the Lord and not to a political cause for the sake of popular opinion. And that is a man. I'm sorry, but that is a man. Whatever you think about Israel Folau, he has the courage of his convictions, unlike many people today who simply just follow what other people are doing. These people don't have courage to stand. But the Lord is my defence and my God, the rock of my refuge. The road to ruin remunerates its own builders, however, and I'll close on this last section, and I'm sorry it's taken a bit to get to. Verse 23, And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. It's interesting because Psalm 916 says, The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Proverbs 118 says, And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. Psalm 7, 16 to 17 says, He made a pit and digged it and is fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. Again and again, we see this in the Bible. We see that the reward of sin is the wages of sin. When we do a work at work, we're expecting the wages of it. Well, the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. We remember this happening with Haman in the Old Testament. We remember how he built a gallows 50 cubits high for Mordecai. Mordecai was just a lowly Jew, a guard. And here is, here is Haman, second in charge to the king, builds a gallows for Mordecai that Haman himself ended up being hung on. He built it in his own house. His house ended up becoming owned by Mordecai's cousin, Esther. Mordecai ended up filling Haman's job as the prime minister of the known world at the time, second in charge only to the king. Interesting how that happens historically. We seem to see it time and time and time again in the Bible. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Many people think that the manner in which they are living leads to life. Yet they think that it's a way that seems right. And we've looked at those that are evidently wicked people who are evil, even in our own sight. And yet the Bible says they are simply sheep that have gone astray. And we've all done that. We've all gone astray. We've all gone our own way. It's, it's easy enough to look at the wicked of the world and point them out as wicked because of how they don't line up with our own selves. But if we were to compare ourselves with a holy God, we've all gone astray. We've all gone astray. We've all gone our own way. In one way or another, we're heading down a road to ruin and that road leads to hell. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Yet Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Friends, we are living in the last of days. We don't know how that time's going to manifest itself. We don't know if we've got a decade or two or maybe even three left. We don't know. But we do know and we see the signs of the times and we see the direction and we don't know how quickly that's going to manifest itself but it's one thing to be able to look at the world and wonder how much time is left which we don't know but and we see how quickly things can change but there is another thing that we don't know individually we're not promised tomorrow individually we're not promised another day we're not promised another moment Individually, we have no idea how long we've got left. And if we were to die in our own sins, there is a judgment to be faced. And that judgment leads ultimately to a lake of fire that was condemned and created originally for the devil and his angels. Our sin puts us in the likeness of the devil. God didn't want that. He didn't desire that. His desire is that none would be saved. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Sorry? That none would perish. Sorry, that none would perish. He desired that all people would come to the knowledge of him and God wouldn't have made it difficult for us to attain everlasting life. He sent his own son 
the Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh to die for our sins that we might be saved. Justice was poured out upon Christ because God is a just judge. He cannot, he cannot abide the wicked. He cannot allow sin to go unpunished and that punishment was poured out upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And if man would believe, man would have salvation through that shed blood. There's no other way. You believe that being 51% good will get you there? Well, great. So does everybody else. So does everybody else. That's nothing unusual. Hey, I'm better than that guy. Well, great. So does everybody else. And there's nothing unusual about that. It's not a horizontal comparison that we need to make. It's a vertical one. There's a time that it's going to be too late. And that's the time that I'm imploring people who are listening to this message not to wait for. There is no better time than now. The Bible says this day, today is the day of salvation. There is an opportunity to enter into his rest and to do so today. Not to wait, not to wait. There's nothing to wait for. There's nothing to wait for. That time when I was with my girlfriend in that house watching these end time prophecies, the individual teacher spoke about this mark of the beast. I'd never heard of that before. And I said to myself, right, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. I'll wait for that. I'm so glad that I didn't. I'm so glad that I didn't. There is a time when it's too late, but it's not yet. So please, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Believe that he died for your sins. Just believe. Will you believe is the question. Will you believe? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you, dear Lord, for this time. I thank you, dear Lord, for the hearts and the minds of those who have heard the gospel this morning. And I pray, dear Father, with all my heart, that you would touch some lives and that those lives would turn to you, that they would believe the gospel, that they would be saved, that they would know the truth, and that they would in every way be set free and live the life they were created to live. I pray, dear Lord, let none tarry, let none tarry, let none wait. Let them turn to you and turn to you now that they would believe in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Watch over them, watch over us, strengthen us for the work ahead, strengthen us with boldness for the gospel and let us share the wonderful joy and the truth of Christ to all who would hear. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.